And so why, do we, why are we teaching this in this course? Well, if a lot of the methods we're going to be talking about today and in the future, the distinction of whether people use likelihood or Bayesian approaches for them and what they mean. So make sure you understand well what's going on under the surface so you can start to make good biological inferences. Okay, so here's a joke about likelihood and Bayesian. If it's not funny yet, it will be by the end. This is how you can judge whether you're learning or not. You know, how funny you find SKCD. Okay, <coughs> so first let's start with gambling. All right, so this is not theoretical. I actually have candy. Okay, now look inside your name tags on, your, on the table and you'll see a sticky note. Okay. <coughs> so write your name and your guess for where's my coin go. Uh -huh. So for this coin, flip it has two heads, one tail. I'm going to flip it 18 more times. Okay. I want you to guess how many times of those 18 will be heads. Okay. Write your guess on on the piece of paper. What? I have flipped the coin three times and it has two heads and a tail after I flip it. Right. So head, head, tail. I'm going to flip it 18 more times. So out of those new 18 times, how many, just the number, you know, 6, 12, whatever, are going to be heads? And if you guess it right, you get a candy, which you can eat yourself or share with a friend or whatever. Okay? And there's enough here. You don't have to play any game theory. You know, try to guess the less probable numbers so that we have, you know, everyone has an equal chance. Uh, so uh, when you're done, don't, don't fold it up. Give it to Tyler. What? You'll, you get, get, get what? Oh yeah, yes, yes names. Yeah, you, you need names. Yeah. Oh, yes names, yes, yeah. We're gambling for actual stakes. You need to have, you know, who's going to win? Yeah, if you know too much, don't talk to your friends. Okay. Yeah. So your No, your total out of the next 18. So you have no data going in about, yeah. So out of the next new 18 throws. No, no, no. I'm flipping it 18 times more. <laughs> I'm not getting paid for this, but I only, you know, give up with that much. So 18 times more, and how many of those are going to be heads? All right, we good? All right, so let's talk a little bit about probability and likelihood. Okay? So, basic start. So, probably getting a single heads, getting a probability of heads is P, right? Um, is this function. Okay? And we'll come back to the, this later, so you'll see why. Yep. Anyone else have one? Okay, can you? Yep. <coughs> yeah, just keep the numbers up, but erase everything else. Um, so, you know, this is basic intro stats. Everyone knows this, right? And of course, the, you know, this probability you think it could go from any range, but actually it's bounded between zero and one. Makes sense, okay? Getting two heads, given probably p, is p squared, right? Again, pretty basic stuff we know, okay? So definitional stuff. So probability of the data. Given p is p squared, right? So probably of these data, given that, is p squared. We can also write it as data given p, right? And we also call that the likelihood, right? So likelihood is just, and we often reverse, so likelihood of p given data is probably the data given p, okay? That's what likelihood is. You often just have, have this comes out of the programs mysteriously. This is actually just what it means. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, <coughs> let's look at this region where it's defined. Okay. So that's the likelihood. And different data have different likelihoods on this, right? So if I have two tails, they're probably having two tails. If we're probably getting heads of zero, is pretty high. Right? Probably getting two heads in that case is very low. Okay, so you see different data have different likelihoods, right? And that's why we use likelihood to estimate this stuff. All right, so let's take our coin example. We have, 
um, two heads and a tail. Okay, and so for that, here's the likelihood surface. Okay, so what's the maximum likelihood value here? What do you say? Two thirds. Who agrees with two thirds? Wait, point seven five. Here, two, two thirds. Point seven five. Point five. Okay. What are we looking at here to figure out what the maximum likelihood is? At like the maximum likelihood estimate is. The peak, right? The maximum. So here's the likelihood. Where is it biggest? There, and then shoot down. Right. That's the maximum likelihood. It is. It's taking that likelihood surface and finding the peak on that. <coughs> okay. So that peak is right there. Two thirds. Okay, and intuitively it makes sense. If I gave you some mysterious computer program that gave you one one zero, what's wrong with giving one? Hey, you'd probably say you don't know anything about the computer program. Probably two thirds, right? Now, if that's the case, though, then <coughs> you would all say, um, given you know, the, the coin flip here, you should all say twelve, right? So I did head head tails. Maximum li maximum likely estimate of that two thirds would be. 12 for the 18 flips, right? So apparently none of you know what likelihood means, right? Since you all guessed way down here, except for, except for these three. Anne, Heather, and Elizabeth, good, you can leave, leave the class. Everyone else, <laughs> good. Right, <coughs> so you guys are using something different for some reason. Let's talk about what that is and why, okay? First, a little bit more about likelihood. <coughs> so you need likelihood for continuous traits too. So you have to think about it, and you know, it's, it's easy when you think about discrete traits. You can do binomial, you know, calculate it. Um, for continuous traits, it seems a little harder, but it's actually not that bad. So here we see for a geospiza, Darwin's finches, right? And a tree, and their beak depth, okay? And what we're gonna do here is estimate the evolutionary rate, that sigma squared for Brownian motion we talked about earlier, okay? <coughs> and here's the likelihood service for that. So what's the maximum likelihood estimate here for the parameter value? Yeah, around, around 0.2. I think it's like 0.118. Uh, 0.18, yeah. Good. <coughs> and so what we can do is show you what these parameters mean. So I could simulate Brownian motion if I have this rate down here, get a pretty tight clustering of points. If I have this rate up here, bigger cluster, a bi bigger spread, and this right here, bigger spread, like we were talking about, right? And so <coughs> um, this sort of shows us what these parameters mean, and the best value estimate for this is this, this parameter value, okay? Are there any questions about that? Okay, so what are the properties of a likelihood as a method? So it's consistent, okay, what does that mean? Consistency. Does it get the same answer all the time? No, it'd be consistent, but not, but not the right kind, right? Anyone? So it means that if, if you give it, as you give it more and more data, it converges in the true answer, which is awesome, right? So you can throw lots of data at something and get the right answer, which is wonderful. Um, <coughs> except for this little caveat, given the correct model. Right, so if the model is not correct, you don't have this guarantee. Okay, um, one of Joe's most influential papers actually talked about a different method called parsimony for tree inference, and that was not consistent. Whereas for certain trees, as you add more and more data, it will converge on the wrong answer. Right, which is horrifying. You know, get more data, get the, get a worse answer. Doesn't seem very good. Right, um, <coughs> but even luckily, it could be inconsistent if the if the model is wrong. Okay, is our model of evolution wrong? Almost surely. Right, but luckily, the, gen the general thing though has this nice property, okay. It's efficient, okay. So it uses the, uh, uses the data really well, okay. So it requires less data than other methods to get the right answer, okay. It's often biased, okay. So it might have a tendency to be, give you an overestimate or underestimate, but as you get more data, this converges on the true answer, okay. See so the properties of likelihood. say that while usually we have those assurances, there are weir sufficiently weird cases where it falls down on each of those. Okay. But almost always as you're, when you're dealing with a case, 
uh, these are these are okay. Okay, cool. Good. All right, so likely to get really small, right? Um, so just take our coin example again. So if throw once, let's assume that we have <coughs> a fair coin. So probably if heads is 0.5. So likelihood of that is 0.5. If I have five head, thr five throws with two heads, like it's this. 100 throws, 25 heads, like it is this. 500 throws, 150 heads, like it is this. Okay. Um, at some point, it becomes too small. So if you use your computer in R, if you get below a number of one times ten to the negative 308, I think on most most hardware, it just says ah, it's about zero. Right. Um, that's a problem if you want to compare likelihoods of very, uh, very, un very unusual things. And as I think about how we do this in biology, you get the likelihood of a string of DNA, right? Let's probably be having A, T, C, C, G, 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 C for this species and then this species and this species. And, you know, it's a very, very low probability, okay? So it's too small for us to have in our computers very easily. So for convenience, what we do is take the log likelihood usually, okay? So when you're using software, you'll often see it report the log likelihood rather than likelihood. Okay, but that's just a matter of numerical convenience. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. <coughs> so how do we compare models? I would say this model is more gooder than that model, right? How much more gooder is it? Well, one way you can do that is using likelihood ratio tests. Okay, and this requires models to be nested. Okay, what does that mean? Yep, um, I think one model should be a subset or should be derived from another model, just increasing uh, the number of parameters, mm -hmm. or should be based on. Right, so they have exactly. So if we think about, you know, we we're talking about Brownian motion earlier today. One model could have one rate of evolution over the whole tree. One model could have that over most of the tree, and then this rate over the rest of the tree, right? Now, if this is set to be equal to this, it's the same model, same likelihood, right? But if it's allowed to be different, it could be different likelihoods, okay? So those two models are nested within each other, okay? Um, <coughs> yeah, one, one is oh, sorry, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The simpler model is nested within the more complex model, right? So it's not both ways, good. I think it's a weird sort of structure. Um, so we used to use this a lot in looking at models for DNA evolution, right? So compare a model that had two rates of evolution versus one rate of evolution, or three rates of evolution, and so forth, and do likelihood ratio tests, okay? Um, we don't do this much anymore, and one reason is <coughs> you know, this nesting requirement, right? I might have two different models that differ in some way. I might have an ornstein ullenbeck model and a Brownian model with two rates. They're both restrictions of the same overall model, but not of each other, so it's hard to compare them directly. So we use a different approach now, often. Okay, <coughs> and this is often we often use AIC or the Akike Information Criterion. Okay, and this is just an estimate of the kullback liebler distance, which tells you nothing, right? But it's an estimate of the amount of information lost about reality from your model. Okay, and so you know Tyler right now is about 15 feet closer to Boston than I am, right? And so I could say, say you know what's the difference between him in Boston and me in Boston? Okay, and compare relative distances. Okay, and so the relative distance is 15 feet. Now, how far, how close is he? Is he 2,000 miles from it? 1,500, 1,500 miles? I don't know. Right, but I can tell the relative distance between us. Same thing with AIC and KL distance. It tells us the relative dis distance between each model and the truth. Okay, and so actually, if you look at the derivation, there's this wonderful term that says the truth drops out as a constant. Right, so you don't need the truth. You don't need you don't need to handle the truth. Right, we can just go directly to the relative information loss. <coughs> and what we try to do is get a small number here, right? Which model loses the least amount of information? Okay, and so we can compare the relative values of these, and the one that has, you know, are all pretty close, the rules of thumb are substantially close, okay? If one is, you know, seven worse, it's less good, and if it's ten worse on these arbitrary units, it's not arbitrary, but these units, then essentially no support, okay? Now, know this isn't significance testing. You don't say, I have rejected a model because delta AC is four. You say, there's a lot more evidence for, uh, for model one than model two. Okay? And you can choose to only use 
the best model, the best set of models, or you can also model average. Okay. <coughs> so with model averaging, you get, can get the relative support for each model, and you get the estimates for each model, and then you can average them average them together. So we'll see this a little bit more tomorrow. But here I have a set of different models, Brownian motion and various orange and yellow duck models, and various parameter estimates, okay? Um, like for example, our beloved you know, Brownian rate parameter, okay? And each of these models has an estimate for that. Something is different though, 0.47 versus 0.20. And what we can do is look at the relative support for each model, right? And get a weighted average of, the, of this parameter across all the models almost integrating across the model uncertainty. Okay, so you don't put all your eggs into one basket for models. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, wait, wait, yeah. Um, what should we do when you, when I, I mean, if I want to average between, two, let's say, two models that have different number of parameters, then one of the parameters will be NA, right? So what, what do we do there? It depends on whether the parameters are NA or actually set to zero or what. Mm -hmm. um, so for these, um, in the OU models, the alpha is sort of the strength of attraction, right? Um, BM effectively has a zero for that. There's no attraction, you just wander, wander wherever you want, You're not being pulled to some value. And so you can set alpha to be zero here and calculate the average across OU and BM models. Um, whereas for theta, to the value being pulled towards, it's not defined really with Brownian motion with this alpha of zero. And so you could either say, what's the weight of models that have that in it? And say, okay, 75% of the weight goes to those models. And out of those, the model average estimate is blah. But then, then it will, that will require uh, that all the models that I'm averaging, they should have all the parameters. I mean, they all, have, they all, they all need to have the same parameters. Well, no, you, you could, so if you want to do that, the, the parameter is constant across models, yes. But if you just want to isolate and say, I want to look at the OU models versus BM, okay, so they can get the, the model weight for the OU models. So it'd be, you know, 0.97 if you add these up. So 97% of the weight is for an OU process. Mm -hmm. Given those models, what's the, what's the model average rate for theta? And so you, could, you would get the model average weight out of 0.97, not out of 1. But like, for example, if I am, uh, like a silly example, if I want to yeah. uh, on average the uh, Yux Cantor and DTR, for example, mm -hmm. right? So I only have one parameter in common between, between both models, right? Not really. Actually, Yux Cantor is, is uh, nested within GTR. Yeah, I mean, like, but Yux Cantor has only one parameter. And right. Then so people, what, so what we're talking about now is DNA models evolution. Well, who? So... A, T, G, C. And so Juice Cantor has effectively one rate. I'm drawing A's there, sorry. Um, whereas GTR has um, different rates. Um, sorry, D, E, F. And it's the metric. Right, plus the, plus the base frequencies. Yeah. 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 Um, but if I set A to equal B to equal C and so forth, it, it's the same as Juice Cantor. So GTR could be, uh, so they actually are nested. But, 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 you're, but your basic point of there are things that don't have the same parameters in them at all. Yeah. You're right. So like right. If, I wanna, if I wanna have that, if I wanna average those, those two um, models, then I can average um, through A. I mean, they take the mean of A weighted by those. Uh, by well, well those no, what you do is take the mean, take the average of this and this, this and this, this and this, so the corresponding elements in the in the models. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Good. But 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 I mean, you are right. There are models that you can't compare in that way, mm -hmm. and then you just can't model average between those different sets of models. Oh, okay. Yeah. How did you arrive at the weights? I missed that. Ah. It was arbitrary. No, um, the weights are based on the delta AICs. So you take the delta AICs um, and you convert them into the relative likelihoods of the models, and then you can rescale those to get the weights. Yeah. Uh, Tyler? And the delta AICs here are compared to what? Ah, the best model. So you get a raw AIC. Okay. Um, twice the log, log likelihood plus twice the number of free parameters, or twice the negative log likelihood plus twice the number of free parameters. 
and that gives you a raw AIC, um, which, yeah, I don't, I don't have a report here, but it'd be, you know, it could be 1,000, it could be negative 500, whatever. And then you just take each of those minus the min of those, and that gives you the delta AIC. Good. Other questions about this? This is, good. This is great. OK. <coughs> so you know, very few of you guess 2 thirds, right, when you actually care about something, right? So all this likelihood stuff, you really don't care about it, right? You're doing something else in your head. So what are you doing in your head there? Okay. Using like, like conditional probabilities. Here's another cartoon to exemplify it, right? So I'll give you a chance to read through that. Okay, so <coughs> what they're doing there is using conditional probability, and that's not controversial. Okay, we can relabel some of the terms here, make it Bayesian statistics. So probably the hypothesis given the data is the probability of the data given the hypothesis times probably the hypothesis over probability of the data. Right. So have we seen this before? Yep, where have we seen that before? Well, the whole thing is Bayes' theorem, right? Yep. It's yeah, it's, it's a likelihood, right? So probably the data given the hypothesis, probably getting two heads and one tails given pr probably of coin being heads is 0 0.5. That's the likelihood, right? So here's the likelihood. I'll talk about what the other stuff means in a sec, okay? This part's not controversial, okay? This is just mathematical fact. What is controversial is how we set some of these values. Okay, so <laughs> here are the terms defined. So here's the posterior, which is nice. Here's the likelihood. Here's the prior. This is probably the data. Let's walk through it. So the prior <coughs> is what your belief is before you see the data. Okay, that sounds a little weird, right? Like I haven't seen the data yet, but here's my guess about what the reality is. Okay. What you did here, right? You said, I know something about coins, right? Coins are generally pretty fair. So yeah, you got two-thirds heads, but I don't think the coin is actually a coin that is biased towards two-thirds heads. I think it's probably a coin that's about 50-50, right? You just happen to have a short run of data, okay? And so you're bringing your prior information into the analysis, okay? And whether you like that or not depends a lot on your philosophy and what the, what the problem is and other, other, other factors. Right? So if we're building a tree, we could bring in a prior on, well, we know that the phylogeny, based on other data, looks like this. So I put a little high weight on that and see if my new data changes it a little bit. Or I could say, this is my new data driving thing, everything entirely on its own. Right? So you use that prior information or not. Okay. <coughs> um, now, as many possible priors you could have. So here's likelihood. Here could be my priors. I could say, I think the probability of getting heads is the same for any, pro any probability, right? It could be 0.1, it could be 0.5, it could be 0.95, equal chance for everything. That's that red line, okay? So you call it a flat prior, okay? You're not bringing in any, any information. I could say coins in, you know, coins in general have a very strong prior on being fair. So you can put the prior like that. I could say coins and stats examples are never fair and put a prior like that. So say it must be, must be biased towards tails, okay? And they're just, you're probably just going into it. And then depending on your likelihood and your prior, you can combine them to get your posterior distribution and your estimates. And then when we do our exercise, we'll actually work through this. Okay, so you get a better sense of it. Okay, next we have the probability of the data over any hypothesis. Okay, there are a lot of hypotheses in the world, right? Um, how do we calculate this? And so, <coughs> If you have a nice finite set of hypotheses, you could test for each one, calculate, calculate the likelihood, sum it all up, um, and be done. Okay? But in many cases, we don't have that. So this is another algorithm called Markov Chain Monte Carlo we can use for this. Okay? You all heard this before. Let's talk about what it means. Right? So Markov Chain, um, series of steps. Each step only depends on the current state, not states further than the past. Right? So 
example of something with Markov chain is you know, your stock, a stock price of Twitter going up and down. Right? What people care about is what's the price now, and they'll look at its price in the future. Right? They don't care that it started off really high or really low. Okay? Something that does, this is not at Markovian is your house price. Right? If I want to sell my house, move to a different house, I don't want to sell it for less than I bought it for. Right? So I, that past history informs my current state and what, what I do in the future. Okay? So the process we're talking about here is a Markovian. Monte Carlo, uh, it's a place for gambling. Think Vegas style. Right? So all you do is repeat it from a distribution. So we're going to just do this game, Vegas style, just roll it and see what happens. Okay? <coughs> so the example I like to use is um, a hat store. Right? Let's say I didn't know what kind of hat you want, like what kind of hats you like. So we put you in a hat store, and we say, try on this hat. Okay. And then you wander around randomly, and eventually you try another hat. If you like it better, you put it on. If you, like it, if you hate it, you won't put it on. If you like it a little bit less well, but maybe, there's some chance of you putting it on. Okay. And I have a video camera, and I just watch you going around the store doing this for a long time. And eventually, the amount of time you spend wearing a certain hat style is proportional to the probability of you liking that hat style. Right? So if you spend 40 years of time in a, re- in a baseball cap, that's your probability for that. If you spend 10% of your time in a, in a red cap, it's 10% for that. Okay? And you can pull out all these posteriors from this. You can see how this would work poorly, too. Right? So if I just put, put you in, give you two minutes in the entrance, you don't get all the way back to the wonderful beanies in the back of the store. Right? So you have enough time to search throughout the whole space. Right? Um, if you're too picky, you don't pick up anything, then it's not giving you a good estimate. Right? Um, <coughs> and so one thing people do sometimes is, um, Metropolis, uh, Metropolis couple, no, uh, multiple chain Monte Carlo, right? Where it's like putting your drunk friend in there, so he, a heated chain, who will try on anything. It has the same, same sort of preferences as you, but it's a little more loose, loosey-goosey, right? And then eventually you switch hats back and forth. This allows you to search over this space m- more quickly. Okay, so you see like Mr. Bay's doing that, that's what it's doing. It's a bunch of drunk friends also looking around. Okay? <coughs> so this algorithm, we can actually calculate the probability of the data over all hypotheses. Uh, when combined with um, the numerator, okay? So we can use this to actually get these estimates. Um, <coughs> we can compare models with Bayes using Bayes factors, so we can get these um, relative likelihoods um, from observing states during the search, okay? And compare models that way. And that's a lot of the same feel as the AIC um, comparisons, okay? We can also look for relative support for models using a reversible jump MCMC. The same I can hop from parameter value to parameter value, I can also hop from model to model. I see how much time I spend in each model. And that'll tell me how much I like the different models, or how much my data like the different models, when combined with my priors. Okay, so we see a lot of models that do that now in phylogenetics. Any questions about that so far? Okay. So as we'll see in our exercise, uh, yep. Um, so, could you explain a little bit more about what you mean by jumping between models? Okay, right. So, in the same way with um, the MCMC, mm-hmm. we hop between different hats, or different parameters. We could also hop between different models. I could hop between a Brownian motion model and an Ulenbeck model, or Brownian motion with one rate versus Brownian motion with two rates, and see which model I spend more time in. Yep. Now, the trick of that is being able to hop into a more complex model. Um, because if I'm going down in complexity, it's pretty easy. You can just say, okay, take the average of these parameter values, something like that. I'm going up in complexity, and I have a new model with a new parameter. How do I get that parameter value? And most new tries will be bad, right? So it's, it's hard to go back uphill. Yep. Good. Other questions? I mean, the trick with MCMC approaches is making sure they run well and are sampling well. Right? You don't be stuck in the front of the hat store um, or something like that. Okay. And there, there are measures to test that. Okay. Um, now, another trend in, in methods is looking at things with approximate Bayesian computation. Um, you can also do approximate likelihood in the same way. Right? So, <coughs> for Brownian motion, right, we have a, have a tree. We can use a multivariate normal. Right? So, we can basically we can get this from the tree and the branch lengths. We can get this from the root state, plug numbers in. Chug, get the likelihood. Beautiful, right? What if you don't know math, right? Or what if it's a situation where there is no math like that? And there are problems like that in phylogenetics. Um, like we have a gene tree with migration on, on a species network, something like that, where we don't know what the likelihood is, okay? 
Well, we can just simulate many, many times to get it. Okay? So imagine the same thing for our coins, right? So here's, this is the actual coin in Britain that has Darwin on it. It's awesome. Um, <coughs> so we can say, you know, what's the probability of heads for this coin? And we could do what comes naturally and do the binomial, right? And calculate the likelihood and take the maximum likelihood. Or we can um, throw a prior in there and do get Bayesian estimates with the posterior probability. Swell. But if we don't have that, we can do something else instead. So the, the dumb approach that actually will work. So we can say, let's imagine P is two, <coughs> point 0.2. Probably I've had this point 0.2. Let's simulate a bunch of tries with that. Let's take my original data set and re-simulate it many, many times. And I can see how often I get my original data set back. Okay? And that gives me an estimate for the probability of the data given this model, right? which is in this case is point 0.10. So I did that for a simulation to do that many, many times. And here's a true likelihood surface, right? Here's the approximation. Not very good yet, right? But if we do 2,000, it's better. 20,000, it's better. 200,000, it's pretty good, OK? And so if you can't write the equation for something, you can just simulate under the model many, many times and calculate it. So if, if you wanted to do the like, likelihood of a, tr of a tree with Brownian motion, and you didn't know how to do that, you could use, this, use the simulation code we did earlier, just simulate many, many, many times and do it. There's more nuances than this, but that's the basic core of the approach. Okay? Um, yeah? Uh, just to back up a little bit, um, when we're talking again about the probability, the overall probability of the data, mm -hmm. That would be um, the, just thinking about it, that would be, so we have to come up with all the possible set of, the set of all the possible hypotheses, and that would be the joint um, right. distribution uh, of the probability of our data under Any all... Right, which is hard to do for continuous parameter space. Mm -hmm. So then we can instead use this MCMC approach to estimate the entire right side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Prior times likelihood divided by that probability of the data. Right. And yeah. then when we when we're calculating the this, uh -huh. all the hypotheses are weighted equally for that part of the model. No. So we don't oh, no, so yeah, no. good, good good question. Yep. So when you're going around the probably the probably the hypothesis, you could have equal weights for it, but you might not. That's, that's your prior. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you could say sure. have a very strong prior on having this rate be twice that rate. Yeah, but or, that's or equal. But, mm -hmm. yeah. but that's that's the prior part. And I'm talking about um about calculating the, the data part, the probability. So, so the, so the, the, the MCMC uh, does this whole thing. So the MCMC is to calculate this whole thing. What they do, so what you do in practice is you take a step, you compute the likelihood of the data given that step mm -hmm. for that particular value, and also the, prob the prior probability of that value. You multiply them together and compare them to where you were mm -hmm. and do that many, many steps. And that's how you get this. And so so that's the numerator. So the, 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 so the MCMC approach uses each step as a numerator. And so if you could sum up, if you could sum up these over everything, it would be this. So another way to write this is okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, P, yeah. P D equals D given H times P H over all H. Okay, thanks. Yep. Good. Other questions? Okay. Um, discussion. Right, so we have discussion now. Um, so, you know, we see that for you, for you folks, you used a prior here to get this estimate, right? Um, for actual data you're using, though, so if I say I'm having you estimate Brownian motion, just like, like that Finch beak data, right? Would you use a prior or not, and why? So 
So you have a prior on what the rate of evolution is for, for beak depths. So I said to you the beak depth is going to change by, you know, one millimeter per year on average. Would you believe that or not? Well, wouldn't that have to do, wouldn't that have to do with uh, whether the trait was under selection or not? Mm -hmm. I mean, so if if the trait weren't under selection and the prior date, you could probably construct a prior, but if, the, if it were under selection, it would be a lot more difficult to construct that prior given, uh, given even previous data. Mm -hmm. And one thing to think about, um, so in practice for this area, um, so if you're doing like, you know, evolution of, of, a, of selection just as particular species, you know your species well. It's your species, you have it in the lab, you have it in your fish tank, and you mess with it all the time. So you have a good sense of that. Here, people will often do, as Joe said, you know, take a, a trait and look, map it across all angiosperms, or even just a family of angiosperms, or a, a genus of angiosperms of some rank. Um, yeah, so you often don't know what's happening in nature as well. So it can be hard to know selection versus drift versus other factors. Yeah, but even if you thought you knew it well, I mean, if I said to you, it's evolving by, you know, 10 centimeters per, per generation. You'd probably say that that's a crazy value for, for you know, finch beaks, you know, fish, finch beaks, right? So you have some information going into it, right? So would you use that in that case or no? Well, I, I mean, you, you would also have to, if it were under, under selection, I mean, you, you wouldn't be able to model, a fu I guess, future, you wouldn't be able to model it because you, you don't know, I guess, whether or not the selection, whether the, that the selective landscape is going to change in the future. Right, but I mean, again, with this, we're trying to reconstruct the past. Oh, the past. Yeah. Um, um, and there are models, though, Brownian motion can model certain kinds of selection, mm -hmm. but not others. And if you think it's, you know, a stable optimum, you can model that with an OU process. You can say, oh, we'll use OU instead. And compare the compare OU versus Brownian motion. Yeah. How about the other folks? What do you think? Would you want to have a prior on beak depth or no? Sure. Okay. Good to her. Good to her. So I wonder if the prior itself has uncertainty. And for example, everything else being equal, I have two prior estimated from a small and a large sample. Should I place more trust in the prior that estimated from a larger sample? Ah, so yes, if you have previous data from different, from, you know, blue jay beak depth, and you want to use that, or goose beak depth, use that information as priors. Yeah, or like two independent group estimate the same thing, but one has a small sample size, one has a larger. Mm -hmm. So this is why one nice factor of Bayesian analyses is what you get out is this, the probability of the hypothesis given the data. Right, so it's likely you get the probability of the data. Well, I don't care, I have the data. I don't know how likely it is. What I know is this thing I'm trying to estimate you know, am I very confident that it's 0.5 or is it a very wide range? And so Bayesian approaches give you this, probably the hypothesis given the data, and that can be a range. That so could be, you know, um, something like this, or it could be something like this. Same mean, but you can use this as your prior for the next step. So here I could say, I could use this posterior as my prior for a different data set, or this plus year for a prior for a different data set, rather than a single point value, which makes it nice, too. So, it, so it naturally gives you this estimate of uncertainty, whereas it's likely that you have to do, use some other approach to get uncertainty. Look at, this, look at this, the um, slope of the surface, um, do bootstrapping or other approaches. Yeah. Um, now, you might not be, so one approach some people do is do a hyper prior, so do a prior on the prior. Um, and yeah. I don't know how I feel about that, actually, but yeah. Hyper priors, what? What's better if, I mean, it's often you use, I mean, or, or you use a hyper prior when you're um, like kind of shaky on the prior. It's like, okay, I don't know that much about the prior, so I'll put a prior on that. But um, it seems like overcomplicating things. Why don't only, why don't just like increasing the variance of a prior instead of adding another prior on top of that? 
Yeah, I, I don't use hyper priority, so I don't know. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in? Can I say something? Um, just related to this topic, I think one reason a lot of us chose nine instead of twelve is when I when I see two over three, that's from this priors are from the sample size of a three, and from my past experience of maybe doing a lot of throwing coins, I know it's 0.5, so I place the more trust in my, in the 0.5. Exactly. Instead. Yeah. So, and, and that makes a lot of sense in this case because you probably do know something about coins, right? But for generic computer program five, you know, you'd probably put more weight on what the original data gave you, right? So, one problem with Bayesian approach is that someone could say, "No, you're an idiot. Use the use the coin you actually have, right?" And so you can have, depending on your priors going into it, you can get different results out. Um, so people have done, for example, for tree inference, people used to do priors on branch lengths. And at first, the default prior was a uniform prior for between 0 and 10 changes per site per branch, right? which is a huge range and includes really, really, really fast evolution. Okay? If, they ch if they change the default prior in the program to be exponential, they've got different trees out and different support for the trees. Right? So it can affect your results and sometimes there is no, no flat prior you can use. And so that's one of the re reasons the Bayesian approaches are sometimes controversial because you know what you put into it can help affect what comes out. So I have a question. Like, can you? Um, well, I don't know how redundant or circular that is, but can you test or how computationally expensive that is? Uh, can you test just a ton of priors and see and compare between the posteriors to see what uh, which have the largest? Yeah, I mean it's a little weird because. If you said, okay, so you can do that and see how robust it is to the prior. And that's nice, right? Because you can say, all right, yeah, you guys could fight me over whether to use the coin or my own intuition. doesn't matter. I still get this estimate out. And that can make it stronger. Um, what can be a problem sometimes if, if people say, let me try different priors. That would have made a weird result. Okay, I mean, let, let me not, not use that prior. You don't want to do that. Yeah, then that sounds like an ad hoc kind of thing. It's like, yeah. I will do something until I get something fancier right. or something. My, that my looks belief nice in the past has changed because of what I see yeah, in the present. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, but checking robustness is nice to do. Yep. Another thing people sometimes do is compare a likelihood approach and a Bayesian approach and say, okay, I'll try to compare them both, see if we can get the, get the same basic story out. Right? It's biologically meaningful in the same way. Okay. Yeah. I have a kind of naive question. So say you and your drunk friends are all at the the hat store, like, can you be too drunk? And like, does that like if for the for the multiple chain Monte Carlo mm -hmm. is, can you have too much drunkness? Yeah, so you can spend too much time in the bad areas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it would take you longer to estimate well. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so if you use a program like Beast or something like that, it tells you effective sample size, right? So that's sort of telling you how independently you've drawn from that distribution, and so. It's, it's, that's one measure of, are, are we doing a good job searching across this space? Yep. Good. Other questions? So if, um, I'm trying to get a sense of what the, what the difference between Bayesian and likelihood approaches would be if you were uh, pretty naive about all your parameters and you just use flat priors for everything. So you had no knowledge of anything previously. <coughs> So then the, the top of that would just, would just be the likelihood divided by the probability of the data. And in terms of my understanding, the probability of the data is this kind of this weird, non-intuitive thing that... You add up across all the hypotheses, all the possible hypotheses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, so they're not necessarily the same, and it's a subtle point. So Paul Lewis had a paper, I think 2001, maybe not then, but uh, it was actually a science paper about likelihood versus Bayes, and I had a good example of this. Um, so let's say we have this surface, right? I'm listening out of Star Wars or something. Um, but this surface, and th we get the same sort of surface with, with or without a prior, right? So this is with likelihood or likelihood times prior because we have a flat prior, right? So what does Bayesian give you as an estimate? Well, it integrates across this, this surface, right? And so it, <coughs> you know, find It'll probably give you something, you know, 95% credible interval, um, be something like here, right? So you do the whole thing, and the, mean, and the mean of it is like somewhere here, right? What would likely to give you? Well, it gives you the maximum likelihood estimate. So it gives you something right here, 
right? So with Bayesian approaches, you, your estimates come by integrating across this parameter space, right? Where luckily just cares about the single best one, okay? Now if you look at the confidence interval for likelihood, if you do like, you know, delta two log likelihood units, like Edwards suggests, you could do something like this, and you, so you might find, you know, all these points are in that region, but the actual maximum estimate you get is different than what you get from Bayesian. So it could be different in that case. In the theory used for things like likelihood ratio tests and some of the efficiency and so on things for likelihood, those are really for the case they're asymptotically correct as you get lots and lots and lots of data. And when you do that, the curve doesn't look like this but tends to be very a narrow normal distribution and, mm -hmm. and these pathologies are, are kind of ruled out. Mm -hmm. But of course that means that you're only reassured if you have a very large amount of data and for a modest amount of data, then you don't really have the reassurances of those theorems. Right. And so a lot of the models we'll be talking about the next couple days will have, you know, 20 species or 100 species in one character, right? And try estimating, you know, three parameters with 20, 20 data points. Not the, not the lot of data there, right? Um, other questions about this? right place to place that question but um i've been always have i've always had trouble um with uh, uh consensus trees because they're kind of itchy what i think is like I, and i don't know if that's if that's a, a good intuition about those or not but given that you spend i mean the computer spent a lot of time sampling the uh, uh parameter space either uh, bayesian or or like or in likelihood and then you get a maximum likelihood estimate or the best tree in, on base or whatever and then you mix a lot of trees up, like plates from different trees in, in, the, in your consensus, but that consensus, chances are that was not sampled, right? So is that, how credible, I mean, at least if you give me a, like a maximum likelihood estimate, you say, okay, this is the likelihood of that tree, and I say, okay, that's good. But if then you just like blend a lot of trees together and smash them together, then that's like, how, why people do that? Yeah. Um, so let's back up a, a second. So when you're doing a search, like so if we're doing a search for actually a tree topology, right, instead of a parameter value, um, it's like walking around the store and recording all the hats, but the hats are different topologies. So you might have that and so A, B, C, I might have C, B, A, and you might have A, B, C again, right? And I keep those samples. And a consensus tree is a way of averaging across trees that have the same leaf set. If they didn't have the same number of taxa, it'd be a super tree approach, right? But here we're doing uh, same taxa for everything, so we're not going to get an, sort of an average tree. And <coughs> what you can basically do is say, okay, how often do I have, let's make, let's make one more taxa on just to make it more realistic. Okay, how often do I have a split that's, you know, AB versus CD? And that happens twice. How often do I have a, B, C versus D. That happens three times. How often do I have um, A, C, D versus B? Zero, right? And what you do is find <coughs> the tree that shows, you know, all the ones that are compatible, basically, to get a consensus. Um, and so here the consensus tree would actually be A, B, C, D. And you can say, okay, I see this 100% of the time, and I see this 67% of the time, right? Um, when in actual reality is this cloud of trees, right? And I might not have actually seen, it might not be a topology that I've seen in any of the analyses, that's true. I mean, I think what it is is people want to get the tree, and so they like to see this. Um, but for comparative methods, what you can do is if you have the cloud, you can use the cloud of trees, right? You use your posterior distribution. I say, what's the rate of evolution of beak depth well, here I have my, my GSP as a tree, but it's not very certain. I'll use this set of trees. As you was saying with bootstrap trees for infinite contrast, you could do bootstrap trees or Bayesian post burn trees in the same way and do that for these methods as well. 
Yeah, it's not quite the bit what you want for Bayesian because you don't want to do you want to do everything jointly rather than the trees and then the data and then the comparative analysis. We want to do jointly because maybe you know half the trees are a little bit bad for the data, but so it, it's good enough for what people use. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So basically, I have a kind of a, like imaginary problem I suppose. So let's say you have two hypotheses for for which the posterior probabilities are pretty similar. And then how do you um tell them apart and is there a way that you can actually estimate like type 1 and type 2 error rates for that? Can you is there a way you can basically see, you know, false detection? No, you you don't do type 1 type 2, but you can do the, but you can do the relative posterior probabilities and say there's a lot more evidence for this one or that or they could be similar. And Bayes factor sort of gets at that, but using the uh, integrated likelihood rather than a single posterior probability. Um, but yeah, you could say, you know, in, the, in some sense it's nice because you can say, you know, 67% posterior probability that this is, the, this is the truth, and 23 it's this, and then the rest is small. And so you can talk about it that way and very naturally, you know, give your confidence for things. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, one interesting trend in comparative methods is talking about the parameters and the confidence in the parameters rather than talking about rejecting nulls. Okay, we'll talk about this a little more tomorrow. But, you know, as Joe was saying, do we think the tree of life has one rate of Brownian motion o over the entire tree? No, right? Do we think any species has had the entire same rate of evolution throughout its entire branch? No, right? So the true model is this complex thing with different rates of evolution, different attraction, different movements, different trends. Right? So rejecting a trivial null of the same rate, well, of course you're going to reject it. Once you have enough power, you're guaranteed to reject this trivial null. Right? But the question, what we actually hear about is, you know, my bi biological question, do my parameter estimates give me information about this? You know, is the geospeed of beak depth evolving faster on this island than this island? In a way that I can say I'm pretty confident in. So that sort of question, rather than rejecting trivial nulls. So there it comes become, becomes a problem of parameter estimation and doing that well. Other questions? All right, so now we have a data break. Oh, we still have some, 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 more, some more time. That's good. Um, other thoughts on this? Questions about Bayesian or likelihood or other approaches? I just want to say that um, remind also of the comment that a statistician made that all models are are wrong, and but some models are useful. Mm -hmm. So an idealized an idealized framework in which all of the each of these models has a probability of being true. In real life, the probability that any of those models is true is zero. So. As lovely as as this Bayesian framework is, it too has you know even setting aside all other all other issues, it too is 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 only a rough approximation because we we can never ever get to the to the true model. Right. Yeah. I have a one rate model and two rate model, and I say the posterior probability of the two rate model being true is ninety five percent. Doesn't mean there's actually ninety five percent chance that that's actually the truth of reality, right? It's just how much you want to wait for that model. Sort of, it's among among all the models you're considering, exactly, uh, and weighting them by approximate probabilities that probably aren't exactly true. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, one approach that's being championed by various people um, is looking at model adequacy, right? So we can so all this stuff tells you which model fits best or explains your data best, right? But it doesn't tell you what it's, whether it's doing it well, right? Um, and so it could be that, you know, um, you could simulate under a Brownian motion, you can try different rates and say, okay, this is, this is the best rate, but you can actually look at the data and find it has two different clumps, right? Your Brownian motion model doesn't predict that, right? So something happening in biology that you're missing, okay? There are various approaches now, like related to the ABC approaches, so that you see, you know, are, do data, are data simulated under my model like the real data? And if not, then there's some component of your real data you're missing. And then we have to go back and make a better model. Okay, so it's very exciting people who develop methods because like, oh, wow, there's a really cool thing about biology we're missing entirely. Let's deal with that. Um, for a user, though, 
You say, okay, here, I have model one, model two, neither explains my data well. Okay, right? So it tells you to be cautious about the conclusions, right? but it doesn't immediately give you a solution. Other questions about this? Okay. All right. Let's take a break. Let's pick, pick, pick it up again at four. Yeah, I'll flip the coin. Yeah. When we're, well, I mean, let's say we already, we already have our tree and we're doing the character, like, trait mapping backwards. Uh -huh. um, how do you like traverse the tree, like from the from given all the set of parameters at the same time, and see what set of I mean, but what the set of ancestral states uh, will reproduce the tree, or only from that node up, or from that node down, or it depends on what you want to do. Um, if you're like independent contrast, it's basically just looking at the, at the clade moving down. Mm. But for a typical like estimation, what you do, um, there's two approaches. I mean, you can have evasion and likelihood and stuff like that, but um, one is you can say, what's my best state here integrating over what could be here and here and here, elsewhere in the tree, right? So you get the marginal estimate. So the best estimate integrated over all the other things, mm -hmm. okay? Or you get the joint estimate and say, let's take this and this and this and find the estimates over the whole thing that give you the best likelihood, okay? The way I like to think about it is, you know, marginal is you know, your favorite food, that you integrate over all the meals you have, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas your joint is your favorite meal. Okay. Yep. But, like, to me, it seems like kind of uh, <coughs> counterintuitive uh, to, like, the dot character mapping because you know, I mean, in theory, you, let's say you know what the leaf, uh, the leaf states are. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what you measure and that's what yep. you have in the lab or whatever. But then, so then you, you I mean, you, I will expect to start from the leaves because that's what you know and then you go back. But then, the leaves are the future. I mean, compared in the in the tree space, right? So it it makes more sense to start from the bottom, that, but then you don't have the the root trait. So how how can you resolve that? I mean, so um, here, get even, right? So this node right here. So the sense of that node have state one. Right? Do you think the best estimate for that is one? Sure. <laughs> Do people agree? Think about like Brownian motion, right? It's probably somewhere between one and, you know, here's 17, 15, 12, 13. So maybe it's like seven or something like that would be my estimate, right? So that intuition, what's driving the intuition? Well, it's both the descendants, but also stuff in the rest of the tree. So that's why the entire tree is used to help estimate the state. Good. Yep. Um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes also there's a need for effectively a prior at the root, too, when you're doing this in social state reconstruction. 